Welcome to Brain Science, the podcast that explores how recent discoveries in neuroscience are helping unravel the mystery of how our brain makes us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 209. Today, we'll be talking with Dr. Luis Pessoa about his new book, The Entangled Brain, How Perception, Cognition, and Emotion Are Woven Together. This is a follow-up to episode 207, which was an encore plane of our first conversation in 2014. The content of that episode was probably challenging for many new listeners, but Pessoa's new book is intended for a more general audience. You can find complete show notes and episode transcripts at brainsciencepodcast.com, and you can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. I also want to mention that the Brain Science mobile app is now called Brain Science Podcast. This app is available for all mobile devices, and it's a great way to access both free and premium content. If you're having problems accessing your MyLips and premium content, please listen to the end of the show for additional information. If you would like to get episode show notes automatically every month, just sign up for the free Brain Science newsletter, either at brainsciencepodcast.com or by texting Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. That's Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. When you sign up, you get a free gift entitled Five Things You Need to Know About Your Brain. Brain Science relies on the financial support of listeners like you. You can learn more at brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash premium. And be sure to keep listening after the interview because I will review the key ideas and share a few brief announcements. Okay, Luis Pessoa, it's so great to talk to you. Do you realize it's been nine years since the last time we talked? I'm really excited about talking about your new book, The Entangled Brain, How Perception, Cognition, and Emotion Are Woven Together. It seems like this is the book you were dreaming of writing the last time we talked. Would you like to give us an overview? Yeah, I think so. I think that in a way, this is the book that I wanted to write for a general audience. The previous book was a specialized book to researchers, maybe students, graduate students, and so on. But this is the book that I wanted to write to introduce the notion to the general audience, to just people who like science and are interested in knowing a little bit more about the brain, to really be exposed to the idea of the brain as this complex system. It's not only complicated, lots of things going on, but it's also complex, and we can unpack that as we discuss today. But the idea, in one sense, is that to a large extent, we need to understand the interactions of many parts of the brain working together simultaneously in the generation of behaviors. So we typically might think that a brain region is fairly specialized or very specialized in some cases and does, let's say, function X. It's involved in memory processing. It's a certain kind of visual perception is a certain kind of cognitive operation is certain kind of emotional process but the claim in the book and i tried to write this in a way that invites the reader to consider this themselves it is really about how regions work together collectively and it's a product of collective computations if you will that generate these properties that sometimes we tend to attribute to individual region so we tend to put all the intelligence in little pieces of the brain. And I'm just trying to encourage the reader to think that it's probably, or it could be, at least in my view, in my framework, a lot more distributed than we have been thinking about for some time. And we're going to go into that in more detail. But I was thinking as I was looking, reading back on the transcript of our first conversation, that at that time, we talked about the fact that fMRI was just on the cusp of having the resolution to really study subcortical structures like the amygdala. And I was wondering if if you could address how the progress in this area has affected our understanding of how these things work together. Functional MRI is a technique that is sensitive to the overall level of oxygenation in the brain. So it's 
it's a really at the macroscopic macro level that we're looking at. We're not looking at one neuron, thousands of neurons. We're looking at hundreds of thousands of neurons, perhaps a million neurons in one given pixel unit that we are recording. So this is quite distant from where neuroscientists typically feel more comfortable. They like to look at spiking rates of individual neurons in different parts of the brain. And since we've talked last, nine, 10 years ago, there has been quite a lot of development in fMRI pushing the technique to be able to scan at higher temporal and spatial resolutions. But in these 10 years, we've moved the needle a little bit. So instead of having these units in which we collect the data, they're called voxels, they're volumetric pixels. Instead of having them two, three millimeters on a side, they're a little bit around one millimeter or so. So it's still very large compared to the unit of neuronal function that we want to measure. And blood oxygenation is because it's blood related. It's a very slow evolving signal. So it's very different from the high frequency spiking activity that neurons generate electrochemically. The hope for fMRI is still there and we, we keep on pushing the technique because it's an, the non-invasive technique that we have to study humans. But in a dream world, we would be using a different technique, right? So if this was science fiction and we can just make up what we would like to do, we would like to have access to neurons or populations of neurons in a much higher, both spatial and temporal resolution. So we're not there. And, and it's probably going to be the case that we're always going to be limited with this technique, functional MRI, and possibly quite limited in most non-invasive techniques, right? Because to do certain things, we need to open up the brain and do things that we can't just do from the outside. And when we're looking from the outside, we get this broader macro picture of what's going on. I wanted to just continue at the big picture level and ask you to talk about how the ideas in your book diverge from traditional thinking. That's interesting. Let me just say one thing. Figuring out exactly what is traditional thinking is really hard in neuroscience because once I started talking about these ideas, I wrote the book and whatnot and started talking to people even before that, a lot of people say, okay, what's so different? And so there's a whole spectrum. And I think when you push the field a little bit, maybe too much, they push back by saying either we knew that all along or it's not what we really meant. And But I do read neuroscience as a field that is very strongly committed to standard reductionism, trying to decompose this complex system, the brain, into a set of parts that have well-defined functions. With these individual parts having well-defined functions, then our task is to put them together. Of course, we need to understand how they work together to support complex behaviors, but it's very much anchored on this notion that is traditional in science, which is let's divide and conquer. Let's divide this complex problem into simpler problems that are more tractable. And the brain should be amenable to that because from what we think about it, it has these different parts and the different parts probably, or the idea is, have these individual functions. And then if only we're clever enough, we'll figure out what the individual functions are and we'll gradually come to a deeper understanding when we put them back together. We build it back together, compose the whole system that we decomposed back up, and then we have a better picture. So I do think that my proposal, my view, goes against that notion. And whether that's a standard notion, the extent to which people really believe that you can break it in these individual functions, I think that people will state it in different ways in different contexts. So that's the part that I have more difficulty but at least the way that we typically talk about the brain, and there are plenty of books out there, we have a very strong tendency of breaking things down. The amygdala does this, the striatum does that, this part of cortex does this other function. And so I think that we still have that very ingrained in our way of thinking and at least of communicating things to a broader audience. 
Right. I mean, when it comes to the broader audience, they are not aware of the more subtle parts of the conversation going on in neuroscience. And all they get is the oversimplified modular view. And then the other thing you talked about in the book that I thought was really interesting was the hierarchical part, the assumption that the brain operates in a hierarchical way that really reflects the society in which neuroscience first emerged, which, you know, was a Victorian, very hierarchical way of looking at the world. One of the things I really appreciate about your book is that it really comes down to saying to me, when we ask what an area does, is that really the wrong question? I say often on my show, asking where is the wrong question. And I think your book does a great job of explaining why it's the wrong question. I share that view, as you know, and I really think that we really need to move to a more collective way of thinking, a collective computation, collective functioning of this system. If we're going to make progress in understanding the really hard problems, which are not the laboratory problems that we can now do. We put a person in the scan and there's only so much that we can study. We have an animal in a lab experiment. They can't be embedded in their natural environment with their in their natural habitat with predators, or with prey, with their energetic constraints. They have to obtain food and so on. They have to mate. They have to take care of the young. As we move to these kinds of questions, my bet is that we're going to start to understand more and more the limitations of this traditional approach that we have developed, which was very well suited for these laboratory experiments that we've been performing in well-controlled settings. But I think they poorly approximate the conditions under which we really need to study the system, and we really would like to, and we just don't because... Scientists want to control everything and we can't control everything. Then we put it in the lab and we say, no, just do this isolated cognitive aspect. But behavior is not isolated. We start looking like that guy who's looking for his keys under the lamp, even though he knows they're not there. Yeah, I don't quote me on that one, but yeah, I think it's very much so. I think that we end up doing that too much, right? So we have these kinds of equipments, these techniques. We have functional MRI, we have recordings of a certain kind, and then we can only do certain experiments that is a little bit like looking at the key, for the keys under the light. And we're pretty much hoping that the keys are somewhere around, not too far. But I, there are days that I'm not very optimistic about that. And I think a lot of other neuroscientists are becoming more worried about that. And there's a lot of a younger generation that is pushing very hard for more naturalistic ways of studying paradigms and ways of studying brain and behavior. And I think it's going to be very fruitful and very excited about these new ways of thinking about it and studying animals and us, humans, animals. One of the things is that our technology always influences how we understand brain function, right? If we just measured random neurons like they did at the beginning, we got one picture and now we have these techniques where we can measure many more neurons, you get an entirely different picture. You find out that even within a certain area, they're not all doing the same thing. Yeah, we're learning so much, right? As you say, these new techniques now, they can record thousands of neurons simultaneously. It's really incredible. And even in multiple parts of the brain, let's say the visual cortex and prefrontal cortex. And so as we start doing that more and more, the picture that is emerging is starting to be different. And It's much more dynamic, much more context dependent, much more state dependent, the state of the organism. Am I well fed and healthy or am I injured or am I being challenged? Is my body being challenged in ways that that I need to devote resources to it? Then it changes the responses. And we're finding that only now that we are able to record simultaneously across many parts of the brain with thousands of sensors simultaneously. Another important theme in your book, Luis, is the fact that we don't know as much as people often assume. We talk about that? That was one of the things that I really wanted to talk about, which is a few years ago, I was reviewing and reading a book by Ralph Adolf Anderson from Caltech. And I know that he interviewed, I think, both of them. 
And I was really surprised, but really thought it was really so refreshing the way they describe the problems as we know so little, we know very little still, and we really have to be optimistic. We scientists are very optimistic, but we have to be more open about the little that we know. When I said to write this book to a general audience, I didn't want to overpromise and say, look, this is how the brain works. We know all of this. I wanted to welcome questioning a little bit like we neuroscientists question the ways in which we can interpret the data, how we can put findings together, how we can develop new paradigms, use new techniques. And I wanted the reader to have a little bit of a sense that it's not in any way, by any means, any a finished product is very much a growing body of knowledge that is always morphing in slightly different directions and growing and reforming and reformulating the questions that we think are important. It's really very dynamic. I wanted a reader to understand that it's not a fixed product that they're consuming, so to speak, but it's a very much ongoing, evolving narrative that I think at the core, it's how science is. It's my view of science. It's not something that we as we're reading textbooks, and we get fascinated by science when we're young by reading textbooks that present it as a very static object, but it's hugely dynamic. It's amazing that anybody gets into science, given the way that it's taught as a bunch of set facts. That's really boring. The reality is a lot more interesting. So getting back to the modular view of the brain, since it's been a dominant view and it's really been dominated by this attention to particular areas of the cortex and then now to some subcortical areas, especially the amygdala is the one that many people have heard of. So perhaps we could use the amygdala because in your book, you take several different parts of the brain and explain what we know about them in isolation and then talk about how they actually it gets more complicated when we have to look at them along with other parts. But could you just take the amygdala for a minute to illustrate some of these key ideas in your book? So the amygdala is this obviously fascinating structure that has in our general culture associated with fear, with emotion, with negative emotional processing. And there's a reason for that. It has been studied for many decades in that context. It has been studied in the context of fear conditioning or aversive conditioning in which a stimulus, let's say a light or a sound is paired with an aversive shock, for instance, and the animal learns this association and treats the light or the sound that were benign at first as aversive events. There are physiological changes in the animal that they would have with an inherently aversive stimulus, such as the shock itself. And it has been shown that the amygdala is really critical to the learning of this association. In fact, without the amygdala, it is very difficult for animals and humans, given that there are rare individuals with bilateral amygdala lesions naturally occurring because of calcification of the tissue of the amygdala, that they are really incapable of learning these relationships between a neutral event and an aversive event in a way that is fast in a few trials. They still can learn it, but it takes a very long time. So the amygdala is really key to this fear learning, if you will. And others prefer not to use the word fear. Fear is something that, according to some people, might be something that is it requires the feeling and it's the conscious aspect of it being more linked to how humans experience it. But calling it fear or aversive conditioning, the point of the fact is that animals, ourselves included, really require the amygdala to establish this relationship. So in some way that would be interesting to track down sociologically, it became ingrained in society that is this region of fear in the brain, right? So as this complex set of sociological <laughs> developments that led to that view. And it, and it is true that it has this involvement. It's really critical. But the fascinating aspect, Ginger, is that when we study the amygdala, and we have studied the amygdala in neuroscience for many decades now, then we learn of its involvement in many other realms that are incredibly diverse, we find that the amygdala is really important in reward-related processing. It's not a primitive structure learning some basic conserved relationship between a neutral and an aversive type of information. 
It has been shown to be important for economic decision-making, for decisions involving social interactions that a primate might have. It is important for attentional processes, and it's important for decision-making. So the range of its functions and its contributions to functions is really astounding. It is really incredible. It's fascinating. So if we have that picture of it as the fear center, we're really distorting things to the extent that we're just characterizing something that is really multifunctional and multifactorial, is involved in multiple things by just highlighting one of them. And so it feels that one of them is important, but it feels rather arbitrary to just focus on one of them. So I think that we need to learn with the more challenging way of describing functions of regions as much more multifunctional and being comfortable with that The fact that I can't just describe you with the color of your hair or the color of your shirt. We have multiple attributes that jointly in multiple contexts define who we are. And these regions also are are very complex and we need this kind of complexity to describe them. Right. And I went to medical school almost 40 years ago now. And back then, amygdala, never heard of it. The structure that we talked about was... The hypothalamus. Right, hypothalamus, of course. That was the early center of the emotional brain, right? As you know, we would learn the limbic system as defined by its connections with the hypothalamus. If you have a direct connection to the hypothalamus, you're part of this system because you have direct contact with the center of the emotional brain, the hypothalamus. We put that aside for a while and then we switched it with the amygdala. And this story doesn't work with the amygdala either. They're incredibly important structures for emotional processing. I'm not taking that away, of course. No one's going to deny that. But we have to understand how they operate jointly with other regions. And we have to understand how they operate in and perform other functions. So is this complex mapping, right? Many to many, not just one to one. So since you mentioned the limbic system, I'm going to go ahead and ask you something I was going to ask at some point. One of the modular ideas that just won't go away is the limbic system. Could you just talk about why this idea is both outdated and wrong? It's my big screening test. Every time I get a book, if it has limbic system, I actually hesitated. I hesitated so much. Should I even name it? Should I even contribute to perpetuating the existence by naming the limbic system? And I go back and forth with it about this as I talk to people or I write in general for review papers or chapters or review chapters because it became completely enshrined and taught across medical schools, especially that there's this specialized system, the limbic system that is dedicated to emotional processing. Those were incredibly interesting ideas that started in the 30s, in 1937, with Papess, the circuit of Papess, and then in the late 40s with McLean and the triune brain. Those were valuable, interesting concepts, but they're so outdated now because we've learned that the regions that were supposed to be the center of emotion are involved in so many other functions and mainly in other functions, and vice versa. We learned that other brain regions that are really important in emotion were not part of the limbic system. We end up with a situation where people say, limbic system is just what our current understanding of the emotional brain is. There's no contribution to the concept there. If we're going to use it synonymously with emotional brain, it doesn't stand for something on its own, and it just makes us confused as to exactly what is meant. Is that the original meaning from 1949? Is it the further developments in the subsequent decades? Is it now from 2023? So it really doesn't stand the test of time. And I think we really should be letting it go. But neuroscientists are obsessed with the term as much as anyone else. And they seem to not let it go. And they say, oh, you just need to define it properly. I think if we were robots that always define everything perfectly with a statement, this is what I mean and whatnot, and just speak for hours saying exactly what you mean with some description of everything you mean, maybe that would be fine. But we have to 
agree a little bit on what the terms we use. And I don't think this term is very helpful at all, because if everyone is using it slightly differently, we don't know what we mean. And it perpetuates the idea that the emotional system is somehow separate. Absolutely. I think that you said it better than I said it. Much, much better. It suggests that there is a specialized system for emotion in the brain. There are many parts of the brain that are incredibly important for emotion-related processing. The amygdala is one of them. The hypothalamus is one of them. There are many, many others. We can spend a long time writing many books about these regions. That's not to say that they don't exist, but it's not an encapsulated system that you put in a box and surround them and say, here is the emotional system, the emotion system, the limbic system, and whatnot. We have to let go of that way of thinking of putting things inside of boxes. And so another example of how our understanding has to evolve, you talked about the standard hypothesis, and I I didn't actually realize this when I interviewed you the first time, because I know we talked about it, but it wasn't until I read your new book that I realized that you and Ralph Adolf had dubbed this system. So you were actually debunking, you might say, something you once thought was right, which I think kudos to you because people don't usually do that. Can you tell us about how, say, the demise of the standard hypothesis is a good demonstration of how our understanding of the brain is constantly evolving? So let me just mention a couple of things so that the listeners can understand a little bit better. So the standard hypothesis, the way that we described this many years ago, Ralph Adolfs and I described it, was the idea pretty much of what we've been talking all along. Many neuroscientists were describing a system that evaluates emotional content in a way that is very encapsulated from other ways of processing, other forms of processing. So it's autonomously in an obligatory way, evaluating emotional content in the world in a way that is possibly automatic, independent of attention. And it involves the amygdala in a way that is encapsulated from the rest of processing. So it should function in a way that is independent of attention, is independent of cognition and other processes. What Ralph Adels and I did was to evaluate that and reconceptualize the way that we can think about emotional processing as something that is embedded in many ways and contributes to many other ways of processing. So when you want to do something that is can be described as more cognitive decision-making, you're engaging circuits that also engage these parts that were being separated and called the emotional system, the standard hypothesis system. Again, it goes back to the idea that we need to let go of these separate islands of specialization in the brain, and we need to think more at this distributed way in that multiple regions engage in functional circuits such that jointly they're able to solve tasks that are confronting the individual, the animal at that moment in time. So it's not something that is localized to a single spot in the brain. It's something that recruits a whole circuit or a whole network or multiple networks that form in a dynamic fashion that then support these behaviors that we might have at some point trying to attribute to a single region in the brain. Okay, so let me clarify, because it sounds like perhaps I misunderstood, since I didn't read that original paper, when you were calling this the standard hypothesis, were you already attacking the hypothesis at that point as being insufficient? Right. So Ralph and I did was at that point, both, we did it completely separately, and then we joined forces, so to speak, in that paper, which is we were studying the ways in which the processing of emotional content was dependent on awareness, on attention, on context, on other these high-level factors. And we came to the same conclusion independently via a different set of studies that looking at it as this independent system that is so powerful that it is engaged no matter what, independent of your state, attentional state, cognitive state, is problematic. So we were criticizing it from the get-go. From that point, we proposed an alternative framework to look at the system, one in which, as I mentioned just now, that it was embedded into networks that participate in many other processes. So that was the project that we worked in that paper jointly, was to 
See, let's evaluate the evidence really carefully from these two different perspectives, his lab and my lab and the entire literature at that time, and see how strongly does it support its autonomy from the rest versus how integrated it is with the rest. And we came on the side that it was highly interacting and integrated with the rest. And then at first there was the evidence that it seemed like this would go on unconsciously, but even at that point you had evidence that it required consciousness. Because one of the things you talk about in the book is a number of examples of things that were once thought to be unconscious that we now realize involve consciousness. That seems to be like a trend related to the way we measure, it sounds like. One idea is that, let's say, when I process some emotional stimulus, say the, something that was linked to an aversive shock, a mild shock that we use in the laboratory that we titrate so the individuals can tolerate it, but it's unpleasant. So let's say we have a stimulus that is paired with shock. The question is, when they see that stimulus, say it's a picture of, of a building and that pictures of buildings are always linked with shock, for instance. So in the future, when they see a picture of a building, they have an autonomic response when they see that. Their skin conductance increases, heart rate changes, and there are changes in the brain. So can those changes happen even if you're not paying attention to the stimulus? Let's say you're distracted in a task or if they're presented so fast in a way that you're not even aware of them. So we refer to this as not being necessarily, not totally conscious of having been presented that stimulus. So what is interesting about this is that there was a strong claim that it happened in an automatic, unconscious fashion. Ralph and I found a lot of evidence that it also depended on attention and other factors, and it didn't happen necessarily in this strongly unaware fashion. It was linked to processing that we seem to be aware of. But I have to say that line of studying has continued to this day, and it continues to be an active research question. And I think the question is still out. The extent to which it depends on attention and awareness is pushed by the two groups, if you will. And there is some evidence, and some strong evidence, I should say, that it does have a degree of autom- can have, I should say, a degree of automaticity and of not engaging awareness very strongly, that is quite impressive. So I would qualify that statement that when we wrote the review quite a long time ago, we cited on, on the view that it requires attention and awareness. But now it's not an area that I'm pursuing very actively, but I read quite a bit. I look at the literature that there is some evidence that suggests that there's more autonomy. So it's a matter of degree. And I think there is evidence for both sides. And yeah, I think it's a very interesting and important question that's still actively researched. Another place we see that modular view and people are constantly exposed to it has to do with, of course, with the cortex itself. What is the best alternative to this approach? Yeah, so the best alternative to this approach, I think, has been, I think it it must have been discussed many times in your show as well, in your program as well, Olaf Sporns and many others. And I think Olaf has been... Yes, he's been on a couple of times. Yeah, a couple of times at least. And many people have championed this view that became quite popular in the early 2000s across many scientific disciplines, not just neuroscience that we need a systems thinking that is networks oriented. So there are these networks that we should understand complex phenomena at the level of networks, a social network, a technological network, a a brain network. So I think that provides an important alternative way of thinking about the brain in terms of a networked organization in which there are these multiple elements that are interacting ways that form these complex networks with complex properties. I think one of the difficulties of studying it that way is that we still don't have the techniques with invasive recordings that are still the gold standard so that we can obtain neuronal recordings. We still have limited ability to study these network interactions with signals that are neuronal in origin, 
to test more specific hypotheses. Even though it's an alternative way of thinking about the brain that is now more and more popular, it receives quite a lot of pushback because it's quite difficult to test and it's quite difficult to make predictions that really can be tested at a more mechanistic level that a neuroscientist would want, a more hardcore neuroscientist that would want to test this hypothesis against a more modular approach would require certain ways of, of going about this problem that are still quite challenging. But as we said just a little while ago, with recordings across multiple thousands of neurons across multiple brain regions, we're really now in a position to answer that, that we can provide alternative explanations, provide better explanations based on these network properties than we could by focusing on isolated regions. For the sake of my long-term listeners, you know, it used to be a thing to speculate that the brain was a so-called small world architecture. And one of the things you say in the book is that it turns out the brain is not a small world network. Could you explain what a small world is and why the brain does not qualify? And that relates directly to the technology because we now have the information that allows us to know this. And this is still an unresolved question, but let me tell you my take on this. The brain being in a small world, what it means is essentially the following. Brain regions have neurons that through their axonal extensions connect with neurons from the same area, the local vicinity and nearby areas and some far areas. So there are these types of connections that neurons have, that the areas have, which are more local and more far reaching. A small world organization is one in which an area of the brain might be highly connected to neighboring areas, but has a few connections that are really long range, let's say from the back of the brain, almost to the front of the brain, or quite far in terms of brain tissue. And the important aspect of these connections is that with these kinds of architectures, it has a really a remarkable computational property because it allows signals to propagate in a system that is not densely interconnected. It's not that everything is connected to everything else. So if it were, everything can affect everything else, but it's definitely not. It's much more locally connected, but it has some connections that are long range. With this arrangement, what is the remarkable property of the small world is that you are able to just in a few steps really travel and influence many brain regions because each one has its local connections, but a few long range connections. So it rapidly, the information can really spread. Like we know, unfortunately, with viruses and gossip <laughs> and social networks and other kinds of things, they can spread incredibly fast, even though not everyone knows everyone else in the world, of course. This is a remarkable property. Even with just a few long range connections, the brain is already able to exhibit this property of a small world. But what seems to be the case now based on anatomical tracing studies, the ones that look at these axonal fibers and how they connect with other brain regions, it seems that the brain is much more physically interconnected than even is actually needed to have efficient propagation. In a sense, you would already be able to spread all this information just with a few extra random connections or long range connections, I should say. But we're finding that these parts of the brain are more densely interconnected than they would even need to, to be able to spread information fast. So it seems, what I call it is like, it seems that we actually have a kind of a tiny world in the brain in the sense that there's such density of anatomical connectivity that it lends even stronger credence to the idea that we have this ability of influencing each other. The signals have much more power of influencing each other compared to a system that is more isolated. So if you had only one region that was really insulated because it only has roads to it, just really its neighbors, then you would be more insulated and not be able to influence and be influenced by other regions. But they were seeing that the anatomical highway system, if you will, is really dense. So there's a lot of room 
from this physical infrastructure for communication of signals. So the brain is not even small world, it's actually really a tight integrated architecture that allows signals to influence each other in really remarkable ways. I think giving a remarkable ability of context dependence and flexibility of computation that we see in all animals that survive to this day. One of the things you mentioned in your discussion of the network approaches that stood out for me was, because you had a really nice figure that illustrated this idea, is that functional networks, because functional networks arise when different neurons are talking to different neurons and any neuron could be in more than one network, and that these networks can overlap. That's an important idea, this idea of the overlapping, which means that even if I say, oh, I measured that this part of the brain did X, it doesn't mean that it couldn't also do Y. Right. So the view that I have and I share with some colleagues and has existed since the time of Heb is that there are these sort of neural assemblies that are essentially these networks, but these networks of neurons or neurons that come from separate areas of the brain, they form dynamically. So in the sense that we have to think of them functionally, not just structurally. So obviously, if I want to go from town A to town B, I need a road to go to that town, but it doesn't have to be a direct path. It can be an indirect one. I can have a very indirect path from here to Philadelphia, and that still takes me there. So even if there wasn't a direct connection between D.C. and Philadelphia, there could be cultural exchange, commercial exchange via other roads that might go first to some other city and then to Philadelphia. So in the brain, it's the same situation. We, Because these connections can interlink directly as well as indirectly multiple disparate separate parts of the brain, the way that I think is important to think about the brain is in, as a functional system that is based on this anatomical highway, these highways, but it's sufficiently separate from it because there are so many ways of communicating that the way that signals propagate and emerge from that physical infrastructure will be highly dependent on the specific context. So in that sense, these areas can participate in multiple processes depending on the interactions that they have with other parts of the brain. So if a given area is interacting with two other areas at one time and several other areas at another time, it actually is participating in possibly related functions, but it could also be participating in quite different ways than we observed in the first setting. So the modular approach sort of appeals to our attraction to reductionism, right? But it really does oversimplify what's really going on. I, I, when we talked the last time, you said, and I honestly only know this because I reread the transcript, not because I remembered it for nine years, but you talked about the need to embrace the complexity. So talk a little bit about why we need complex systems theory, what that adds that's beyond what we get from network theory, because network theory is easy to explain, although probably not so easy to actually do, whereas complex system theory, I think, is a little bit intimidating to the average person. Why do we need this complex systems theory? I think that we need to move in a more computational and mathematical way of describing the system. Let's think of a situation, for instance, when you have Let's say you have an ecosystem in a certain habitat that has several species cohabiting there and existing in a shared habitat system overall. The way that evolves, given introduction of a new species or the removal of a given species or the addition of certain resources or the subtraction of resources like we keep on doing on planet Earth and changing these environments, it's going to have a number of effects that cascade in really complex ways. So you might affect one species that needs a certain nutrient that is not available anymore. And by affecting that species, you affect other species that interact with that one that is being affected and so on in a cascade of interactions that are mutually related to each other, mutually interacting simultaneously. So you have these webs of interaction 
that I think, to be honest, in ecology, I think it's, to me, is the most um, intuitive, if you will, way of thinking about it, because we are, I think, already used to thinking of the complex ways in which in, in these ecosystems that these interactions can be counterintuitive, something increases and leads to decimating something else, but increases some other predator. And it's these indirect effects that cascade in ways that are incredibly difficult to predict. And in fact, we are really poor at predicting the whole web of interactions and the cascade of effects that are observed. So what we need is tools that are constantly being further developed in mathematics and physics and computer science in many fields that allow us to try to understand these systems that have these really dense causal webs that the interdependence between the parts that say the species in an ecosystem or the parts of the brain in the brain or genes in, an, in genetic networks, how they interact in ways that are not just causal in this standard sense of causation that we usually have. If I hit this, it will break this. And if it breaks it into pieces and it's really clear cut, if you if I'm playing pool that you're going to hit the ball and then it's going to hit the other one that upon that being hit is going to move and so on. It's a completely a chain of events that are easily unpacked, right? So there's one event that causes another event. But when you have these events co-affecting each other, then we need different kinds of tools to understand the evolution of these systems. By evolution, I mean not in the Darwin sense, by the temporal evolution, how they unfold in time so that if I manipulate the system in one way, I introduce a new species of fish in this lake, what's going to happen? <laughs> what's going to happen is usually we are incredibly bad at predicting it. It seems like a really good idea to introduce a new species here. And it turns out to have all these effects that we never anticipated. So we need these tools and these tools are being developed in complex systems and in related fields that might not have a specific exact name, but in dynamical systems, nonlinear dynamical systems and physics of interacting elements. There are many different fields of knowledge that are converging to trying to develop tools that we can address these kinds of problems and understand the limits, the limitations of our own uncertainty. Many of these systems have nonlinear cascades of events that are so sensitive to the local conditions that they can develop in very different ways, even in nearly repeatable initial conditions. Right. And we've learned that the hard way a lot of times. Right. They develop in completely different ways. There are these bifurcations in the qualitative behavior. A species disappears. Oh, but if you did it again, you wouldn't disappear. It actually would be the dominant species. What does that even mean? We need the tools to study that. Luis, why are some scientists reluctant to consider emergence as a valid scientific idea? In some part, for very legitimate reasons, I think that we have been too casual at how we say that a certain property emerges out of the interactions of the parts. And many scientists have been extremely bothered with that kind of language because they attribute it to our momentary ignorance of the way in which it would presumably or does presumably emerge. So it just, it's a way of describing our state of ignorance at that time and not something fundamental about the world, according to this viewpoint, because a reductionistic approach has been so successful in molecular biology, in chemistry, in physics. Why should we resort to properties that we can claim emerge? Because if we knew exactly what the interactions happen, we probably would use a different word and we wouldn't call it emergence. So it's like they think it's just a filler word that... Exactly. They think it's this is a filler word and it's a really bad filler word because it's just non-scientific and it's the opposite of what we should be doing but when a lot of people mean that a property emerges they're not speaking of anything mysterious in the sense that 
There is no basis for it. There is no understanding for it. In fact, the examples that I was describing just a minute ago in terms of these species interacting and leading to the extinction of one species, and maybe in another scenario, another species or the same species takes over as the dominant species and so on. These are actually collective properties that we can study with nonlinear dynamical systems that we can legitimately call emergent in the sense that it emerges out of the interactions of the elements in the system without any mystery whatsoever. I mean, there could be mysteries still in the sense that, and fundamental ones that can occupy philosophers for a long time, is that if we don't have perfect access to the exact state of the world right now, then we can't perfectly predict far in advance. We can predict only a certain window of time that is more limited, not really far in advance, because these systems, they diverge in their behaviors. So there are really difficult issues there, but challenging issues, even philosophically speaking, but there's nothing really mysterious and it doesn't have to be a filler word, like you said. We need to get rid in science, not of emergence as a filler word, but of filler words in general. In neuroscience is very rich in filler words because <laughs> we don't understand the mechanism very precisely. So we say it represents, it computes, it encodes, and so on and so forth. All these words are filler words because in 99%, if not more of the cases, 99.9, we really don't know the details. So we say oh, these signals encode the input or encode reward or encode threat. What do we exactly mean by that? We don't have a description that is sufficiently detailed that we could explain it in more precise terms. So it becomes a filler word just like these other filler words, including emergence. I want to ask you about advice for students interested in neuroscience and especially to focus on people that come from fields like computer science could really contribute a lot, right? But I get these emails from people that are like, oh, I'm in this field and I can't contribute. So could you talk a little bit about what kind of skills could really, how do you get from A to B? I think neuroscience, probably all of science, I'm in love with the brain in neuroscience, so I'll speak for neuroscience. I think neuroscience is broad enough in so many different directions that we there is so much room for contribution and from so many sides. If you come from chemistry, if you come from biology, if you come from physics, if you come from engineering, from mathematics, I think what we need and we see research really flourishing more and more is when these all these component disciplines really are contributing to the overall picture in ways that we, like we're talking about these interaction system level, is the same thing. I'm not a physicist. I have to work with physicists if I'm going to generate some kind of theory at the level of physics that has predictions that we can then, as an experimentalist, I can go and study them. Or as someone who does a study with animals is going to be able to study, or someone who has a more molecular approach is going to be able to test at that level. So it really is the multi-approach that is multidiscipline approach that is really needed. So I would say that if you love the brain too, or if you love other things and you're really interested in the brain, there's an enormous amount that you can contribute because, and we see that all the time. Now, neuroscience and AI, for better or for worse, <laughs> is being highly integrated and a lot of people with technical skills in, in mathematics and computer science and engineering are getting involved. So you can work on something that is very separate from the brain and just use neural networks and AI as, as something to solve some specific problems. Or you can engage in applying them to understand the brain. So I think that there's enormous room for many different sides that can greatly contribute to our understanding of this incredibly complex system, the brain, and how it supports behavior. What else would you like to share before we close? One thing that I really think that is important for us to do a little better in science that we don't do, and I'm part of it too, I think we talk past each other too much in our scientific debates because I think we all have big egos and we want our ideas to be understood and to make an impact. In any discipline like neuroscience that is so complex, that involves 
behavior, involves sentience, involves awareness, consciousness, involves morality, involves so many different dimensions. I think we need a more pluralistic kind of viewpoint or viewpoints that we can address problems from complementary and mutually reinforcing standpoints. So I don't mean that any perspective is equally valid. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I do think that sometimes we become too confrontational is that there's only one valid perspective that should prevail and the other ones are just wrong. A view of science from a more multi-perspective viewpoint, I think is a richer one and is one that I would like to be able to engage more effectively in and not be so combative if some perceive me as being in the field in general, because I think we can make a lot more progress. I mean, I think we need to be incisive and battle things out. That's one thing is the level of the extent to which our ideas are good explanations for the empirical findings that we have, but not to the exclusion of other viewpoints. I think that we need to encourage a more perspectival type of approach that I think is not as fully appreciated. And I think I'm coming to appreciate more and more. That's a really good note to close on. I definitely have observed in talking to some guests in the past that have had divergent viewpoints that I sometimes feel like they are talking past each other and I can't figure out how to to fix that. I don't think I'm the person, but but I think what you're saying is very important. And I also think it's important that scientists understand sometimes how their conflicts are misperceived by the public. You can see how the anti-science types are using some behavior by scientists against them, right? Oh, there's no agreement on global warming. Of course, that's because they're cherry picking the guys that are out there and in the wild, but they can do the same thing when it comes to, not to say that everybody should like close the wagons all together, but we do need to have a way to balance fighting for our ideas against listening. But isn't that sort of what's going on in our culture in general, a lack of ability to listen to diverse viewpoints? I think so. I think so. But I think in science, it has always been like that. So I think in, in, in well, in, in society too, I should say. But I think scientists have this view that we want to find the truth and the one way of looking at something. And I think that, again, it's not to say that all viewpoints are equally correct, but we can understand in physics, for instance, we can understand things from a quantum perspective, from a classical perspective, and I think in neuroscience, we need to foster something comparable to the extent that we actually have multiple reinforcing viewpoints. So for instance, one possibility is like how can we have in a system that is highly distributed certain properties that look more modular? How does a complex system behave in that way? And vice versa, if you have some inclination to think that the brain has more stronger specialization, in certain parts of the brain, how does this contribute to certain properties that are much more context dependent and dynamic and temporally evolving than you would have predicted from a more specific type of computation that you did? So I think that we need more of that in neuroscience and genetics and to have a more sophisticated nuanced kind of science in the biological sciences, which are, I think, quite sometimes different from physics and from other disciplines. But Maybe it's humans where we seem to be sort of wired for either or thinking. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) very much so. Well, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. And maybe we won't go quite so long between now and the next time we talk. (laughs) Ginger, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity and for having this wonderful discussion, this conversation. I'll try to keep my announcements short, but I have to remind you that you'll find complete show notes and episode transcripts at brainsciencepodcast.com. And you can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. I also want to remind you that the free Brain Science mobile app is now called Brain Science Podcast. This app is available for all mobile devices, and it's a great way to access both free and premium content. I'll talk a little bit more about how to access premium content after the episode review.
For the last several months, I've been talking about my upcoming move to New Zealand, but due to unexpected delays in getting my visa, it now looks like it will be sometime in July 2023 before I actually move. I would still appreciate hearing from those of you who live in New Zealand and Australia. I also hope that once I get settled, I will be able to arrange some listener meetups like the one we had in Amsterdam in April. I want to give a belated shout out to those who came to that meetup. I had forgotten how much fun it is to talk with listeners face to face. Wherever you live, you can be sure that you never miss an episode of Brain Science by signing up for the free Brain Science newsletter so that you can get show notes automatically every month. Just text Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. That's Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. Brain Science is independently produced, and it relies on listeners like you for financial support. I want to thank everyone who supports my work, either financially or by sharing it with others. I've actually created a table to help you decide whether my and premium or Patreon is best for you. Patreon supporters who pledge at least $10 a month get transcripts, ad-free episodes, and a copy of my book, Are You Sure? The Unconscious Origins of Certainty. If you're already a $10 supporter, but you didn't get your copy, be sure to let me know. Of course, you can also give single donations via PayPal or Venmo. There's links for everything at BrainSciencePodcast.com. So now let's review the key ideas from today's episode. The key idea of episode 209 is captured by the title of Luis Pessoa's new book, The Entangled Brain, How Perception, Cognition, and Emotion Are Woven Together. If you are a regular listener, you may not find this idea surprising, but Pessoa reminds us that the mainstream view of brain function remains largely modular and reductionistic. In fact, these two ideas are entangled in their own way. The evidence against this viewpoint began accumulating before I started this podcast back in 2006, and we have talked with many guests about this evidence. One key discovery was the realization that individual neurons can participate in multiple networks and that even areas of the brain largely devoted to particular activities, such as sensory or motor functions, can contain neurons that do other things. Back when I first talked with Dr. Pessoa about his book, The Cognitive Emotional Brain, in 2014, I was surprised to learn that the amygdala is involved not just in emotion, but also decision-making. But this actually makes sense if you consider the fact that animals without a cortex still have to make decisions, such as when to approach and when to flee. One outdated idea that just won't go away is the idea of the limbic system as the emotional system of the brain. Pessoa addressed this eloquently in The Entangled Brain, and he told me that he was actually reluctant to mention this in the book for fear of helping to perpetuate the problem. The main reason that the idea of the limbic system is outdated is the very fact that emotion is not tightly segregated in the brain. Sure, the amygdala is involved, as well as the anatomical locations that spawn the name limbic system. But as we have emphasized, emotion and cognition, think decision making, are deeply entangled at every level of the brain. Just try to remember that every part of the brain that is involved in emotion does other things as well. This is what it means to move from a modular reductionist view of brain function to one that encompasses the emerging evidence. One challenge that Pessoa emphasized was the need for new tools and techniques that allow us to study the true complexity and dynamic nature of brain function. These techniques are being developed in other fields, which highlights the interdisciplinary nature of modern neuroscience. Pessoa emphasized that this also means that there are opportunities for those from a wide variety of fields to contribute to neuroscience. He also emphasized the importance of humility and admitting how much we still don't know. The entangled brain, 
How Perception, Cognition, and Emotion Are Woven Together by Luis Pessoa is his first book written for a general audience. But I highly recommend it to listeners of all backgrounds. Best of all, this is a great book to share with someone who's just getting interested in how the brain works. If you are new to brain science, this book will give you an excellent overview. Brain Science is an unusual podcast in that our listeners are very diverse, and my goal is to provide content that you can all enjoy. That's the reason why the technical level of the show varies from month to month. If you want more technical details about Luis Pessoa's work, be sure to go back to episode 207. Also, don't forget to visit brainsciencepodcast.com for complete show notes and episode transcripts. You can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com, and I would love to hear from you. I really appreciate your support, whether it's financial or sharing the show with others. The options for supporting brain science have grown organically over the years, and this seems to contribute to confusion about how to access premium content, especially with regards to episode transcripts. Premium content is not hosted at brainsciencepodcast.com, but individual episodes and transcripts are sold there for non-subscribers. I try to put the My Lips and link for the transcript into the new episode show notes. And if you're supporting the show via Patreon, you should get an email whenever new content is available. Patreon offers several options, including its own app and the ability to put a custom RSS URL into your favorite podcasting app. Similarly, My Lips and Premium content is available by logging into the Brain Science Podcast mobile app or by going to brainsciencepodcast.lipson.com. Most My Lips and users find using the mobile app to be more convenient. I know this is a little clunky, and I appreciate those of you who make the extra effort to support my work. Thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to talking with you again very soon. Brain Science is copyrighted to Virginia Campbell, MD. You may copy this episode to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. The theme music for Brain Science is Mindfire, written and performed by Tony Catraccia. You can find his work at syncopationnow.com.